Welcome to our video, Seven Simple Steps to Developing Leaders in 30 Days. I'm Marshall Shannon, a ministry design coach with ministry design training and ministry design concepts. Perhaps you're sitting at your desk right now watching this video on your computer and you're wondering how can I get ideas to help me develop leaders and to create a process that is correctly fit for our ministry. And how in the world am I supposed to convince others that we need a process to develop leaders? How am I going to keep from wasting time when trying to develop leaders or trying to develop leaders who aren't leaders? How am I going to prepare for the response of my congregation and perhaps my elders or deacons or my church board when I introduce the idea of a leadership development process. How can I help people see the value of it and the need for it? And what am I going to need before I launch our process? How much investment is it going to cost us? What are we going to have to invest? What steps are necessary to make our process successful? These and other questions we want to answer during this time. And we've tried to package these so that you can put them to work within the next 30 days. And here are just seven simple suggestions that you can go step by step, like following a recipe, to help you move your ministry forward for Christ. Here's the first one. How are you going to get ideas to help you develop your process? Well, you want to discuss the idea of leadership development through research and investigation with other pastors and ministry leaders because you want to learn what they've done, what they're doing, what they plan to do, and what they've experienced through it. You're going to borrow brains from your fellow pastors, both in your community or across the country if you need if need be. So you want to ask them what has worked and what has not worked for them? What is the vision for their leadership development process? Where do they see it going? What do they see it becoming? What do they hope to accomplish through building their leaders? And you're looking for ways to couch or to posture your, the concepts of developing leaders as to what it's going to do for your church. You want to know how to present or cast a compelling vision so that people can be convinced in their own mind. Ask them what they do, would do differently if they could start all over again developing leaders. How did they structure their process? What things did they do well and what things did they not do well? What landmines and pitfalls did they uh, come across that hurt them, delayed them, deterred them, defeated them, and <clears throat> how did they select their candidates? How did they select their leaders? And how did they develop those leaders? You can do research and investigation through interviewing them over the phone by Skype, or you can go observe by visiting other churches to watch their process and interview them face to face asking how they do things, or why in the world do they do the things they do, where do they do them, and when do they do them, how do they fit this into their schedule and onto their campus, and why do they do each part of their leadership development process, and who do they do things with, do they have a team of people that are helping to develop other leaders, or is it done just by one, one person, and who do they do things with? Do they develop five people at one time or just one at a time? And what do they do? Learn everything you can by research and interviewing and observing and investigating other ministries so that you're learning from them their past mistakes, their current struggles, the challenges they faced, how to preserve it, how to set it up, what are ideas. If, you, if you're in a small church with under 200 people, I would interview some medium-sized churches that, in, that uh, 
installed their leadership development process when they were a small church with 100 to 200 people and see what you can learn from them about how to fit. If you're a medium-sized church, talk to a large church. If you're a large church, talk to a mega church. But go find out through, because the scriptures teach us in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. One of the first steps we ought to take toward starting a leadership development process is to research, interview, observe, and investigate what others have done, are doing, and hope to do in developing leaders. Here is the second thing. You're going to have to determine what to do to convince others you need a process to develop leaders. So in looking at this, let me ask you, what's God's vision for your leadership development process? You need really to discover and determine what it is God is up to and what God wants it to look like and develop into and how it's going to move you forward. What is God's preferred future for your ministry concerning developing and training leaders for every ministry in your church? What part does it play in God's overall vision for your ministry? Well, you've got to decide how the leadership development process fits into your overall ministry design. And so you must be convinced it is needed and that it must happen. The thing about vision is it can't be just a, a nice idea or something we should do. What really has moved people to, to do things to honor God that were difficult and challenging was that they were convinced it was needed and that something had to happen. It's not should it happen, it's it must happen. When you get a hold of God and his vision for your leadership development process, it should convince you and compel you to invest yourself in it. And this has to happen. It must happen. It is imperative in your thinking that in God's mind this has to happen. You'd be disobedient to do anything else but what God has told you to do. And so <clears throat> how can you convince others if you aren't convinced yourself. And so you must share God's vision with others in your church. But first, you need to practice and perfect your presentation of God's vision until you have crafted a compelling argument as to why God says you must do this. And then you need to produce a concise, clear statement that is in line with your ministry's design, that will be a compelling statement that will inspire and energize and generate excitement among your people that God's called us to develop our leaders and here's what it's going to do for us. God has this in plan for us, in mind for us, and we must partner with him to do this. And so the second step that you take in order to move your ministry forward in the next 30 days is to determine what is God's vision for your work, put it into a compelling, convincing, uh, concise, clear statement, get your elevator speech ready or your breakfast speech across the table from a fellow leader in your church so that you can con convince them with a compelling argument that this is what God wants. Step three is that you've got to decide how to keep from wasting your time and resources when you're trying to develop leaders. And how you're going to do this up front is you're going to decide what type of leaders you want to produce. Are you going to deal just with their head and give them information so that you're instructing them, you're giving them indoctrination, you're telling them how to lead, what's required of a leader, you're giving them task-oriented things. It's all about information dump. Secondly, are you just going to deal with their heart, their will and willingness, their commitment? 
Or are you going to be task oriented where what you're dealing with is just what the task at hand? You take your ministry, you give them a place in leading that ministry or part of the leadership team over a particular ministry in your church, and you say, here are our goals, here's our objectives, here's our strategic plan, here are the procedures, policies, and processes. Get it done. Or are you going to develop the whole person? I would urge you that the primary or, uh, focus of a pastor is to work with developing the heart of your leaders and then your head and hands. It's really developing the whole person as you help them lead because it's their whole person at home, at work, at church, and at play, and any other thing they're doing in the community where they are building their credibility to influence others in a certain way. So you want to develop the entire person, their head, heart, and hands. Secondly, you've got to decide how people are packaged together and how they interact together so that you don't waste your time by making mistakes about putting the wrong kind of people together in your ministry to lead. And I say this because you can take spiritual inventories from placeministries.org or assessme.org. Those are two software packages where they'll charge you a fee, and you're able to give them to your leaders to help them determine their uh, spiritual gifts. Uh, Place Ministries deals with their shape, their spiritual gifts, their passions, their abilities, their personality, and their experience. All four or five of those things are considered. You can go and, and Google and pull up through a search any number of companies who have developed softwares to uh, survey you and your, your potential leaders with a DISC profile. DISC profile deals with, and the DISC is an acrostic that stands for dominant people, personalities, influential personalities, steadfast personalities, and compliant personalities. And then it rates and explains to you what percentage of their personality would be on a scale of 1 to 100, dominant or influential. And do they have a little bit of steadfastness and compliance in them? And what percentage? And so it's a tool, and it usually is, I have found pretty reliable, can give you some idea of how that person was put together in the, in the womb. And then how they have been nurtured. So you've got nature, how God hardwired them in the womb and nurturing how their environment, meaning their teachers and their parents and their pastor and their coaches and their friends have helped them develop. And so there's nature and nurture involved in this. And so you want to look at their shape, their spiritual gifts, their heart, their passions, their abilities, you know, their capabilities, their personality type, and the experiences they've had. Which, by the way, just taking the spiritual inventories or the disk profile and leaving it to itself as though it's an isolated solution to determining where to plug that leader in and where uh, he can be placed to serve according to his strengths, that would be a faulty thought. That would be a myth. You've got to understand as their leader and get insight from God as to their shape. Because a person might not have a great deal of tendency or strength toward a particular uh, task in your ministry, but he has tremendous experience in some way or another that has helped him develop his heart, and he has just enough ability and an, enough personality tending toward a particular ministry. And so you cannot isolate a person just by the spiritual inventory or the disc profile, but they are tools to help give you insight into people. And then you've got to decide how you think teams are fit together. So you take members and put them in a group to call them a team or partners, but to team a team dynamic, how people work together. And so if you have four uh, highly D dominant people on one committee, what might happen? Or if you put 
a, a C, a compliant person who is high in that in their disk profile, over three Ds, dominant people, how is that going to work? Well, you've got to determine through a little reading and research and investigation how people put together their teams so that it is uh, productive, so those people can maximize their full potential that God has given them so they can steward their opportunity of ministry and be effective and efficient in the way they serve the Lord in your church ministry. Well, we move from that to step four. Here is the fourth simple step to developing leaders within 30 days. And that is you've got to discover how to prepare for the response of your congregation when you decide to introduce the process. So you want to discover where your opposition will come from. Is it going to come from your leaders or just from the pew sitter? Is it going to come from your official leader? Meaning your board, your elders, your deacons, your stewards, your trustees, your ministry leaders. Where is this going to come from? Is it going to come from your unofficial leaders in your church? Your matriarchs and patriarchs, your key influencers. So let me give you a heads up. If you haven't done much reading on the science of change and the way people uh, respond to innovation or to new ideas or to change in organizations, whether it be the family or the church family or some nonprofit organization or a for-profit business or industry, you usually have a church that is broken in to people who adopt change at different ways and different levels at different times. For instance, there is a percentage of your church where the people there, there are some instant adopters to change. You have them at hello. You have them, at, you tell them, listen, I've got this idea, and they go, I'm here to help. They're on board. You have credibility with them, you have influence over them, and the way they're put together, they're ready for change because they see it as early as you do. The second set of adopters are the early adopters. You have to present your case, but they are easy to be convinced and can help you uh, provide a convincing argument and help you compel others to adopt the change. And that's to the middle group. The third group is your average adopters. And this is probably 40 to 50 percent of your congregation is made up of average adopters. They hear the case, but you use your instant and early adopters to help you win over the average group that is half of your congregation. The fourth group are those that drag their feet in adopting the change. They're slow to see the need or agree that it is going to help you and it's going to make a difference. And these are the late adopters. But they can be one, but it takes more time, more investment, and you have to be patient with them to come around. Because now you're into over the, the 60 to 70 percent of your congregation is made up of, excuse me, 90% of your congregation is made up of the, the first four levels. And the last level of change adopters are the never adopters. These people will never accept change in your church. They are going to serve as vampires and vultures. Vampires suck the blood out of your ministry and your idea and your vision of, of seeing God's preferred future. And vultures just wait around for it to die and help it die, and then they consume it. And so as you look at this, you're going to have 8 to 10% of your church, if you're the average church, from my looking at the research I've done, that are going to never accept the change. But you'll have 90 percent that will, and you've just got to work with them, and you've got to learn how are we going to convince them through prayer and private conversations and small group meetings, town meetings, uh, congregational instruction, uh, written uh, copy documents to help them, individual friends going in groups of one, two, and three to talk to a family who's a late adopter. 
And so in doing this, the fourth step in developing leaders in the next 30 days is you've got to prepare for the response of your congregation. You've got to learn who's in every group. And I'd take a name and a face and put it into one of those five categories and begin praying through and asking the Lord to help you develop a strategy for leading your church through this change of designing, developing, and implementing a leadership development process. So let's move to the fifth step. The fifth step in this is to display how you're going to help people see the value and the need for a leadership training process. You've got to go to some trouble here to package and present the values and the benefits of what this new development process will do for your church and your community. Show them how it's going to help your church and you've got to couch this in terms that they can clearly see and understand and go, yes. And you've got to show them what it will do for every one of them. How are they going to benefit? If you're talking to parents, how is it going to help their children in the children's ministry or in the teen ministry or in the college ministry? If you're uh, going to help them, help them see how it's going to help them. How, how will it make things better? for both the congregation and the community. And by the way, leaders that you develop in your church also go out into the community, into the workplaces, and have a, a, an impact for eternity there so that it can help you reach more people, help people see that the scriptures give us a pattern of Christ developing leaders, of Old Testament saints like Moses and Jethro, Jethro developing leaders, the early church and the early church fathers, uh, and missionaries in scripture. You see the Apostle Paul, uh, Barnabas, they were all developing leaders. And it's how we have moved forward. The cause of Christ has been with developing leaders who will develop leaders that will develop other leaders so they can give clear direction to a workforce of volunteers in your church. Help them see the values and the benefits of investing the time and energy and resources to develop leaders. It's key to taking any ministry forward to grow through and healthiness through reaching people with the gospel, winning souls, and making disciples. Then you've got to present the need. Why is a leadership development process needed? And you've got to look at and diagnose your church and situation and how it's broken down in some way, weak in some way, not meeting the challenges in some way. Maybe your, your workers are weary and worn and, and tired out. They're exhausted. And you say, if we have a leadership development, we'll have more people carrying the load. And we need leaders before we have tons of volunteers. We need leaders to lead them at every level of ministry in our church. What difference will it make? You're going to take them through this, and they are going to invest themselves in becoming a better leader and then helping others to develop as leaders. So what difference is it going to make? How is this going to impact your church, and how is it going to impact your community? State the values and the benefits and present the need in a compelling way so that you can paint them a portrait of what your ministry will look like with God's preferred future. How is this going to help them? What problems are you going to solve? How is it going to help them personally and their family and their friends and their lost neighbors? How is this going to make a difference? And then tell them a story. In other words, take them on a verbal journey of showing them how you're going, what the situation is now, and how there is such need, and what the preferred future is going to look like. Go to uh, TED.com and look up storytelling, and you'll find there it, speech after speech that shows you how to put together a story that will compel people to see the need and see the values and buy into the future so that you can convince them to move their ministry forward by developing leaders in your church that will serve every person and every ministry in 
your church. You've got to make your argument. You've got to help people see the value and the need for a leadership training process. Next is you've got to design what is needed before you launch your process. You've got to design your process and share your philosophy of training leaders so you can show them the way and how it will work. Because people are going to say, wait a second, how are we going to fit this into our already crowded schedule or already pulling people away from their, their families at night or on the weekends? How are we going to do this without uh, overburdening ourselves or getting out of balance? Or how are we going to fit this into our facilities? Or how are our current leaders going to invest more time to become better leaders? How is this going to work? So you tie together the need and the values and the benefits of this with how is it going to work? So you show them the pathway. Show, to get, show them how to get from point A to point B. Talk to them about the journey as you go. Show them how it not only is the end result going to be great, but the process is a part of the blessing. And so the, the pathway is going to bring rich blessing. And how? What are the parts? So they can see where they might uh, invest themselves in developing others, in discipling others, and making leaders. The procedures and policies that will serve you. These don't have to be perfected, but you need to show them some way of how you see this working in your existing ministry design, how you already are functioning, and what is the real purpose of this, and what people are going to help you, what people will be developed, and what personnel are going to help you do the developing. And so what is needed before you launch your process? And then step number seven is you've got to develop your leadership development process. So what investment will be required to train your leaders and what steps are necessary to make your process successful? Well, here's the answer. To develop your people, you've got to identify potential leaders. Here's a warning. Probably more damage can be done by selecting non-leaders, people who are not leaders, to be a part of your leadership development process, and you're trying to develop a mule into a thoroughbred uh, walking horse or bell racing horse uh, or Kentucky Derby racing horse, and you're trying to develop them into something God never intended for them to be. They might be spiritually mature. They might be a gifted servant in a particular area of ministry, but that does not mean that they are called of God and equipped of God, and you have the raw material there to develop into a leader that will fit well into your ministry. You've got to be able to identify potential leaders because you might do more damage by putting someone in the system that isn't a leader than you will missing someone who is a leader, but you don't identify them. So you've got to invite your selected leaders and invest in them in your process. And so there's an initiation process where people become oriented to what you're doing, why you're doing it, how you do it, when, who's involved, what is it going to take? Why are you doing this? So the, the W's and the H. And they, there's an initiation time where they are becoming uh, comfortable with developing leaders in your ministry. Whether they're the people being developed or the ones doing the developing. Secondly, you've got to invest instruction in them in indoctrination. You've got to deal with their head. Remember I talked about the head, the heart, and the hands? You've got to teach them and make certain that they agree with, they're in alignment with your, your, indoc your, doc your doctrine and your ministry design. So there's an indoctrination time where you're showing them the way, the way that your church in its culture and in its conduct and in its customs and in its ministry design they need to be taught, and you've got to invest in them. And then there has to be mentors that they can imitate. So there is involvement where you are interacting with them, uh, you and your team of developers, 
are initiating people into the process, you're giving them instruction about how it works, you're teaching them to make certain they understand the doctrine that supports it, the biblical teaching, the precepts, percepts, and principles, and the doctrine and theology that is all a part of developing leaders. And then you're going to give them and make certain that you're a good example for them to follow so there's imitation going on. And then you're going to involve yourself one-on-one, -on -one, life on life, life touching life, to bring about transformation of life. And then you've got to implement it, the process, so they can see it happen. They've been told the pathway, shown the pathway. Well, now they're going to be in the pathway as you're carrying out the process. And you've got to invest in them through letting them be there while you implement it. And then there can be some investigation time because things are going to go not quite right. So you've got to monitor and make modifications as you invest in leaders to help them overcome areas where maybe they're serving in their weakness and not to their strengths. And one way to burn anyone out in life is to consistently require them to serve or minister or work in their weak areas instead of plugging them in to serve according to their strengths. And pastor, if you're struggling with burnout, and which by the way I've been told that at any one time 75% of our pastors wish to quit, well part of that burnout uh, problem is that they aren't serving in their ministry according to their strengths. They're, they're focused or serving in areas where they don't have strengths, where they're weak. And everyone has strengths and weaknesses. God packages us that way in the womb. And so don't beat yourself up for that. Go and serve according to your strengths. But help your people through investigating them as they're implemented into the process to make certain that they are serving to their strengths and not to their weaknesses. And, you know, you can use all kinds of tools to help you with this. And one of them is strengths leadership. Another one is uh, Strength Finders 2.0. These are just tools that can help you understand where a person is strong and where a person is weak in their leadership. And I'm not talking about morally. I'm talking about the 22 categories put together uh, by Leadership 2.0 that clearly states for us what the categories of leadership are. It's just trying to get a, a grasp on how God packages le uh, leaders together and what good, solid leadership looks like. And so you do some investigation so that you can give people insight into their own life and into their own ability to lead so that you help them. Because you install the leaders in an internship time where they have a trial period and they're tested by functioning, it's on-the-job training. So you're going to add, add a trial period to a testing time. And in doing these three things together, you're going to teach and train and tutor. John Maxwell, in his uh, series of books that he has written on leadership, says a four-part phase to training a person for a task is to let the trainee observe the leader as he performs the task. That's step one. Step two is allow the trainee to join the leader as the leader performs the task. That's step two. Step three is to reverse that role and let the trainee perform the task while the leader is observing him. And step four is for the leader to step completely out of performing the task, and he is watching the person, the trainee, perform the task by themselves. That's what I mean by training. Teaching is the imparting of knowledge so that they have been taught. Tutoring is going consistently through the process of teaching them and training them until they are performing in a way that you know transformation has come about. Let me give you just a personal example. One of our sons decided at 23 years of age that God wanted him to go serve his country in the military. And so he and one of his close friends decided to, to join the Marines at 23, which, by the way, if you know anything about boot camp and the Marines and the age group, they're 18 and 19-year-olds. 
and the older they get into their 20s, and so my son and his friend were called grandpa because these 18-year-olds were looking at them at 23. Well, let me tell you, they put my son through weeks of torture at 23 years of age for him to prepare himself to serve his country as a Marine. And then they took him from that where they taught him and trained him, tested him, and he had time and was had trial and error, and he was tutored and cared for until he was fit to serve his country as a Marine. So he went through boot camp and combat training to learn how to do this. And transformation came about. It was amazing to see the difference of the impact it had on my son's life from the time he went in until the time I picked him up from combat training. And so as you look at this, we, we want you to have a vision for your development process that it's going to bring about transformation of life for eternity. Then there is, as you install leaders here, an immersion time that the internship bleeds into full-time service. When I say full-time, I'm not talking about being there 24-7. I'm talking about them being given a position, a post, where they are going to have the opportunity to stay there and serve for some time while you're still supporting them and encouraging them and providing continuing development opportunities and training them further but they are immersed into the leadership opportunity until they are acclimated to everything that is their whole environment, the whole culture, their whole job that they are doing, their whole leadership experience. They get acclimated to it in their particular ministry in your church until they can absorb lessons and experience and see what you have taught and trained them actually put into practice and they gain some time to gain experience about what's good and what isn't, what, what worked really well and what just worked okay and what failed. And then acceleration for them to grow and accelerate in their development where they are, the learning curve is becoming shorter and shorter as they are acclimated and have absorbed what they've been taught and seeing it put into practice and they can give attention not only to themselves but now to begin helping you train others to become leaders. And so at that point as they go through this time don't forget to give them some accolades, meaning recognition and reward for a job well done, for going through the boot camp of your leadership uh, development process, for going through the internship and the immersion of suffering through this and with all the bumps and bruises and scrapes that have happened in them as they've had to rub uh, shoulders with the friction that comes with leadership because leadership often involves change and people resist change and so they are dealing with people who uh, you know are difficult to deal with and that's just leadership and spiritual leadership has an enemy that is not seen with the naked eye the forces of darkness and so you want to encourage them and reward them for investing themselves for committing themselves for consecrating themselves unto the Lord's work in and through your ministry so that you can carry out your calling as a church. Well, you may realize that this video is just the tip of the iceberg. It's just the first in a series of videos that we have put together to help you develop your leadership training process. You may not fill the leadership void in your ministry with just this one training video. You may need more in-depth training from our leadership training series. And our leadership training series answers in-depth the following questions. When, where, what, why, how, who, and how of the how of designing and developing and deploying your leadership development process. Well, this series will do a, a number of things for you, and we've packaged it into a, a module, a series of 13-plus uh, videos, and so we're going to help you learn how step-by-step step, to structure your development process, 
how to select your potential leaders, how to prepare people to lead, how to get started with the process, what are the biblical patterns we can use to develop leaders in our church, why should you develop leaders, and what are the benefits of doing so, how to select the right people to lead your training process, what challenges are you going to face as you develop leaders, and what should be your top priority when you're developing people into leaders? How do you develop a culture of leadership development so that it carries on for generations to come? What procedures should you follow? What provisions are you going to need to make to develop leaders in your church? Over a dozen videos to help guide you through the steps to creating your leadership development process. So what will all this cost you if you want more in-depth teaching? Well, our regular price is $79, but our introductory price for the month of June is $49. This is a one-time purchase price. Yet new videos are added at no additional cost. So if you buy this leadership training series, it's going to give you a login uh, code, password, and your username, which is your email address, and allow you access to this leadership training series, a one-time fee, one-time purchase, but we'll be adding new videos and new training to the leadership training series for some time to come. And so you're going to get that additional instruction at no additional cost. So click on the link below to purchase today. Now, you may have noticed that we have a whole lot more to offer that, along with our leadership training series. And so your second option today is to deepen your efforts to by purchasing our ministry design training on a monthly basis. You can subscribe and receive our full services where our team of ministry experts provide video training, live Q&A, uh, opportunities to ask questions online, support documents and video tutorials to explain those documents. All of this is provided with our full service subscription so that you can further your ministry in many areas such as discipleship development, outreach development, ministry design development, communication, stewardship, fundraising, uh, dealing with budgeting and money and any number of other things that we offer to you that you can subscribe to help you develop as a leader so that you can lead your ministry. Now, what is this going to cost? Well, the monthly subscription for one user is $24.95, or you can uh, provide access for your entire leadership team, uh, can subscribe for $49.95 per month. There is no long-term contract or commitment like a cell phone would have. You can cancel your subscription at any time, and there is a no-risk, money-back guarantee that if you don't like what you've learned or it hasn't helped you within the first 60 days, we'll give you a full refund. So click now to start strengthening your ministry in all aspects so that you can grow and develop so that you can meet the challenges that are going to come your way in your ministry. Well, I'm Marshall Shannon, your ministry design coach at Ministry Design Training and Ministry Design Concepts. You can reach me at this email address or either one of these phone numbers. So let me encourage you. Click below at the two links, one for the Leadership Development Series, the Leadership Training Series, and the other for a full subscription to our Ministry Design Training. Lord bless you as you move your ministry forward and partner with God.